Hello, everyone. So uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the 7 by 7 format, what we do is seven presentations, seven minutes each. Uh, I will have my timer on my phone going. And after, so, ah, give me one second. I forget about the echo from having another tab open. So if you ever hear voices while you're in Hopin, it's because you have another tab open. So anyway, so we're going to start with the seven by seven and Dimitri, everybody knows Dimitri. Dimitri doesn't need um, an introduction. Now, let me see on the stage. Can I see how many people we have on the stage? Because maybe we want to wait for a couple more people to show up. So can anyone tell me on the chat if you're watching? Uh, let me put on the event that the seven by seven is starting because I'm not. Um, Seven by seven is starting at the main stage. All right. So let's see the stage. Am I seeing messages? Yeah, I'm starting to see I'm here. Perfect. So Dimitri doesn't need uh, introduction. I am just going to let him go. And Dimitri, as soon as you start talking, I am putting the timer and we're kicking you out at seven minutes. Are you okay? Thank you, Fab. Yeah, Paul, right. okay. Go. Okay. So inheritance and composition could be used for creating class hierarchies since introduction of classes to Lambda in 2006. Truck is a vehicle, but truck has a diesel engine. Classes have types. Inheritance provides a child class with a subtype of its parent class. This enables subtype polymorphism. A VI with a vehicle input may be passed instances of any vehicle class descendants. Composition does not provide host class with a new subtype. Moreover, in LabVIEW, all class data members are private and require special accessor methods to be accessible by child classes. Indiscriminate use of accessor methods leads to leaky abstractions, making class hierarchies rigid and fragile. LabVIEW 2020 introduced a new interface construct. In a nutshell, G interfaces are regular G classes without private data. A child class may have a single parent class, but multiple parent interfaces. When modeling with interfaces, I like to use a with metaphor. Diesel engine class is an internal combustion, combustion engine with a J1939 interface. Truck controls class is not related to diesel engine tuning station class, but both can interact with a diesel engine object via its J1939 interface because diesel engine class has a J1939 subtype. I have two major use cases for G interfaces. First, to enable subtype polymorphism by providing subtypes to classes in unrelated class hierarchies. And second, to enable creating fine-grained reusable code units for building classes, which are also known as traits. While playing with G interfaces, I came up with two simple guidelines. First, make it a class if it is specific to a single class hierarchy. Second, make it an interface if it may be reused by unrelated class hierarchies. However, implementing reusable code typically requires state, which poses a problem. How do you implement a G interface with private data if G does not support such a critical feature. Let's say you need to implement interface A with three private data members, X, Y, Z, and some methods using such state data. This is not supported by G interfaces directly. However, you can put all interface A private data into its child class B private data and implement six accessor methods in class B, two for each interface A data item. Interface A would need accessing such private data through its dynamic dispatch must override methods, which may add some overhead. 
Adding accessor methods by hand is a pain, but that might be scripted. However, class B methods can still directly call public and protected methods of interface A. This design leads to a couple problems. First, interface A code becomes fragile, as now class B code can directly manipulate interface A step. This is bad. And second, code of all interface A child classes becomes rigid as updates to interface A private data required to physically edit code of all its child classes, which might be a huge problem for manipulating large uh, class libraries. Can we do better than that? Yes, it turns out that we can. Let's take another shot at the problem. Class B has an instant of reusable class A in its private data. Class B methods can directly call class A public methods. Class A can have as many private data members as it needs and can directly access them in method code. We were doing all this, all these things this way for many years before G interfaces came into being in 2020. However, composition does not provide a host class with subtype of member. That's why class A public methods cannot be called on class B object wire and class B objects cannot be passed to VIs expecting an instance of class A. G interfaces change that. Let's create a facade interface for class A. Its purpose is to provide class B with subtype of class A. Interface A has two dynamic dispatch match must override accessor methods to class A object, get A and set A. Add all dynamic dispatch public methods of class A to interface A, with each implementation making a call to corresponding class A method using accessor methods. Make class B a child class of interface A, implement interface A accessor methods in class B, you can now call class A public methods on class B object wire or pass a class B object to VI expecting interface A object. Welcome to the stateful G trade design pattern. This brings us to updated guidelines. Make it a class if it requires private data, give it a facade interface if it needs to be reused by a related class hierarchies. You can now easily convert existing classes into stateful traits. Using stateful traits, design pattern prevents fragility and rigidity issues of stateful interface design pattern. I'm done. Questions? You have 28 seconds. Uh, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> and there are no questions on the stage. So I think uh, if anybody wants to follow up with Dimitri, you can go to the um, breakout room. And yes, there was a sighting for Stellcat. All right, thank you very much, Dimitri. I am gonna kick you out. Kick me out, please. Thank you. All right, so that is the timer. Um, so who's next? Sam. So Sam is going to do two. Sam, do you want me to do the timer after the first seven, or do you want me to do it after 14 minutes? Uh, just do it after 14 is fine. OK. All right. So uh, 14 minutes. So I'm going to mute myself, and then I'm going to start counting as soon as you start talking. OK? All right. OK, so I'm going to talk about a uh, mock object framework for LabVIEW. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier today. I think Stephen maybe mentioned uh, mock object testing in LabVIEW. So uh, typically in a system, you might have a test step. And it might use some specific piece of hardware. In this case, maybe a DMM. And it uses a specific DMM. Okay? And we all learned uh, about LVOOP, so we're using classes. So our test step's a class, our, our DMM's a class. And at some point, we realize that if we make a generic DMM class, then we can pass at runtime our specific DMMs, and we can switch what DMM we use, right? So it's the basis of like a HAL or something, right? Hardware abstraction layer. And at some point, you'll probably realize that 
that also allows you to use a simulated DMM. So you can use a simulated DMM for testing or for demos or something like that. But it also lets you use something called a mock DMM. And if you've read any of the unit testing books, uh, that'll sound familiar because I use that term a lot. So what is a mock? A mock is sole purpose is to record all the calls that are made on it. So all the methods that are called and all the parameters that are passed to it. And it doesn't really do anything else. Sometimes you might return some values if you need to. And it allows us to verify that in this case, our test step calls the correct methods and passes the correct data to the DNA. So what we're verifying is the behavior of the test step and how it interacts with the DMM. And so if we use it in a test, here we see uh, at the top, we have the red object is a test step. And then we have the green objects, a mock object. So we initialize the mock object and then we pass it to the test step. And that test step is gonna get used in the next part of our test. And then uh, the orange object is a call log. So we create a log of all the calls that we expect. So in this case, we expect a call to the set DC volts method. We expect a call to the set manual range method with a parameter of range set to 10. We expect a call to the auto zero function and we expect a call to the take reading function. And so we put all those together and we store that in a call log object. And then what we do is we call the test that we're going to, the code that we're going to test. So that's the exercise step. And then the verify step, after we initialized our mock object, it's a by reference object. So once we initialize it, that reference is created. So we split that wire off and then we have this verify method. And we give it the mock object itself and we give it the call log and it, and it verifies that the calls were what we expected. And it gives us a pass fail or a message back telling us what failed. Uh, so creating a mock object is actually really easy in LabVIEW. Uh, there's a toolkit that I created uh, under the tools menu. There's an option to create a mock object. You just point to a class and click OK. And you got to give it the name of the new class, the mock object that you want to create. And it creates the initialize and the verify and does all the overrides for you. You don't have to touch a thing. Um, so. Uh, how, how does it go about the verifying? What can you match? Well, for the parameters, the generic case is just that they have to match exactly, but you can do things like ranges, greater than, less than for numbers. You can do regex or case insensitive matching for strings. You can have parameters where you don't care what is passed to it. You just care that the method's called. Uh, if it passes reference, you can check that the references are valid, or you can do any kind of custom verification that you want. It's all uh, object oriented and you can override stuff. And then for the call log, so, so first it verifies the parameters to, to make sure that the calls match. And then for the call log, you can have a strict call log where it says these four or five methods have to be called in the, in the same order. Or you, there's one that I call non-strict where you just specify like one or two methods and it has to call those methods and it doesn't matter if it calls other methods. Um, but that's all custom too. You can override and set all of that. So uh, if you want to get your hands on this tool, if you go to that GitLab repo there, uh, you can download a VIPC. And there's a little video that shows how it works. Uh, if you go to the bit.ly link there, that is the presentation I did at the CLA Summit. Uh, some future stuff that needs done. It needs updated to use interfaces. So this was written in 2019. Uh, it needs new parameter verification. So I'm going to add some more stuff onto that and call log verifications. And right now, uh, the repo, you can see it says class refactoring tool. So it's part of like a bigger package that has some other tools in it. And I kind of want to separate it out on its own. So that is the end of that presentation. And I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, this one has some videos. So hopefully they work. I don't know. I saw Q's videos and they did not turn out so well. So all right. So um, we were talking about the AF tester. So I presented on this uh, a few years ago. Uh, it came out of the DQMH. So this is just a little video that shows you what happens when you create a new DQMH module, right? So you, you go, you open the wizard to create a new DQMH module, right? We're just gonna accept all the defaults and click okay. And it's gonna generate all the DQMH module, but you'll notice it also generates a test module, right? So test module one API. And so when we open that up, that's going to allow us, so it acts like the caller of your module. And when you run the tester, it's going to let you start the module, send it messages, and then stop it. And so it allows you to run the module interactively very easily. Uh, 
and then there's another video right after this. So it also, the other nice thing about the test room DQMH is that when you add a new message, which we're gonna show here in a second, so a new uh, event in DQMH speak, uh, once we create this new message, it's automatically gonna add a case to the tester to uh, allow you to test that. And so if you've ever used the actor framework, one of the problems is to launch an actor and get messages to and from it, it's really hard, right? So uh, I wrote a little tool to implement something very similar to this in the actor framework. And so, all right, why well, I don't wanna watch that video again. How do I get to the next slide? Oh, this is it. Yeah, this is it, all right, cool. All right, so uh, here I have a logger. It's an actor, it's got some messages. And I'm gonna go down to the SAS actor tester, new actor tester. And it's gonna basically select the class and it's gonna go through and it takes a while. So uh, it'll tell you when it's done scripting. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that like pops up in the middle that I kind of cut out. But basically it creates this whole library that is another actor that calls your actor and acts like its caller. And uh, if you, it's ready to run right out of the box, but you do want to go to the actor tester or the core of the actor tester and you want to rearrange all these controls. I tried to do some kind of like auto placement thing and it just never turned out right. So I just place them all in the corner there and you just drag them to where you want. And I uh, set the path to uh, allow newer existing files. But that's basically it. That's all you have to do. And this whole thing will run right out of the box. Now you don't run the actor core directly. You go to this launch new AUT or uh, launch tester right there. You click on that and it runs and it launches the actor. And uh, I'm gonna specify a path on my desktop, just create a new file. And then I'm gonna launch the actor. Uh, I'll send the path so it knows where to write the stuff and then I'll send it a message and it'll log it. And you can see it records everything that goes back and forth. Close it. And uh, I should pull up the file here in a second and you'll look and you'll see the file. So it says, hello. All right. All right, so now on to our last one. And this shows what happens when you create a new message. So I've got a new message for my actor. And all I'm gonna do is go and run the code again, but instead of selecting new actor tester, I select rescript actor tester. And it will create new controls and a new messages just to test that new message. So now if I go to my actor core, you see I've got some new controls here. I place those and then I can run it again and it'll send the new message. All right, that was probably way less than my 14 minutes. So uh, if anybody has any questions. Oh, actually I do have one more slide with the details. You have five more minutes. All right, so uh, the actor tester code is available on GitLab. Um, there is a bit.ly link that's for a presentation I gave at one of the CLA summits. Uh, I do wanna take a second and thank a few people who contributed. Uh, Casey May is helping me work on PPL support. So uh, originally when I made this, I wasn't using PPL, so I didn't even think about that. And he's uh, made a few pull requests to move us in that direction, but it's not quite done yet. Uh, Christian uh, reported a few bugs. And I think uh, Jeff Spiegel actually also reported a bug or two. And uh, Alan gave me a lot of inspiration. He didn't actually help, but he uh, gave me a few ideas on how to make it better. And so the things I'm still working on are PPL support, and I haven't even tried to integrate it with the new interface uh, in LiveView 2020. So right now it works on abstract messages, but it will pick up uh, self-addressed and abstract messages and create code to test those as well. So, all right, any questions? Fab, are you taking questions in the chat? Yes, uh, you have four more minutes. There's going to be a little bit of delay because there's 20 seconds more or less delay between the stage. Um, but let's see, no questions so far. Four more minutes. Well, I'm happy to yield my time if nobody has any questions. Yeah, let's give them 10 more seconds. Mm. Thank you for the shout out uh, to the DQMH API tester. Yeah, no, it, I like it quite a bit. All right, so you yield your time. Let me. Yep.
cancel. All right. So let me check out Sam. Bye bye, Sam. Bye. Screen and the camera. Uh, same question, Hope. Do you want me to do a single timer for 14 minutes or do you want two seven minute timers? Two seven minute timers. I got to keep them okay. separate. Awesome. All right. So I am going to start counting seven minutes as soon as you start talking. Go. All right. So I was just going to show you guys some useful.net libraries that you can use because. Um, you know, you don't always know about the, the tools that are out there. And I found out about these because Derek taught me about them. So I thought I would share it. Um, so yeah, I think these can be super useful because um, you might be tempted to just write your own solution. Um, but if you just use a pre-made solution, it's often better because it's more tested and, you know, it probably has more features than you would write on your own. So. Let's say you have a customer that wants to be able to type their own equations in um, to their application. Maybe they have some kind of fancy calibration, um, like something more than just li a linear calibration. So they want to be able to type in their, their own equation and have your software calculate stuff for them. So uh, we can do that with this .NET library called MX Parser. Um, I'll show you an example. So let's say we have these variables x, y, and z, and we can just make an expression. x times y plus z squared, calculate. I hope that's right. I don't really know. Two, two plus nine is 11. Yeah. All right. So it looks like it's working. Amazing. So I'll just show you um, how I did that. Um, I just use this .NET library. So you make a constructor for, for, for it. Um, and when you, or sorry, sorry, so you make a constructor for each argument that you're gonna have. So in this case, we have X, Y, and Z. Um, and I'm just doing those three um, as a constant, but you know, you could also have that be changed at runtime. You could make different, different arguments, but I'm just making X, Y, and Z and I'm not really having a default value. So then when you type in what expression you want, when you type that in here, I have a, a .NET constructor where I'm just creating this expression um, from your string and I'm putting in, in the arguments that are used. Um, and then I'm also checking the syntax um, to see if it's proper syntax. So you can see when I was doing this, if, if I don't have match parentheses, then it, it doesn't let me calculate it. So then once you're ready to actually do the calculation, you set the value of each of the arguments. Then you're setting them here. And I'm using that same uh, expression that I created here, right? Um, if I create a new one, then I'm closing the other one. Um, and then I just calculate the result. And super easy, there we go. Um, and why I think it's great to, to use this .NET library is because, you know, maybe if I was just going to write this type of a parsing on my own, maybe I would just support like addition, multiplication, and um, exponents. But with, with this, you could also, you know, do a sine or a cosine, or it has, it supports like a whole bunch of weird stuff. Oh, I don't think you can do the sine of, um, let's do something small. Oh, also, I don't think I, there we go. Yeah, so amazing. <laughs> there you go. So that's how you use that. Um, I'll give you another example of another cool library. Um, it's called uh, PDF Sharp. So if you want to print a PDF document um, and you don't want to use the NI Report Generation Toolkit, which you might not want to, um, then you can use this DLL. Um, it's very simple. Um, also, normally I don't use sequence structures like this when I program. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> so you know, but I just put it in to help, like, um, so I was so I could explain it to you. So first, you create a document, um, and then you add a section to it. 
And then you're going to use the section to add a paragraph so you can add whatever text you want in, in your paragraph. Sometimes it gets a little bit tricky to keep track of all the, the different references. So I tried to label them for you. So, so you create a paragraph there and then you can add a chart. Um, and there's a whole bunch of documentation. If you go on here, you can find out about like all the settings you can do. Um, and you can do a bunch of stuff to format this text, like the font, the color, all of that. Um, but if you just want to add a chart, you can set the size of the chart. Um, in case you're confused by this, how this is working, um, it's it's a little confusing because instead of for the height, instead of this just being like a double that you can set directly, um, you actually have to create an object with a constructor and set that in here. But it's kind of nice because it lets you actually choose like what um, units you're using when you make this object for for the height, and same for the width. Um, so then once once we've specified our chart, we come over here and we can add some data to the chart. So here I'm just adding a sine wave. Um, and then we can specify like if we want grid lines, there, there's a whole bunch of other options here. So I'll just run this. There we go. Amazing. We wrote, we wrote a PDF file. Um, and just so you can tell that I'm actually writing this file, if I turn these off, yeah, sure, whatever. Oh no, I'm almost getting to seven minutes. Right. Where did I save it? Wait. 23 seconds. We'll just overwrite it. Um, there you go. Now it doesn't have grid lines. So there you go. Any questions in the last 10 seconds? Five seconds. That's it. All right. So you're ready for the next one? Oops. Yep. All yep. right. Go. All right. So now I'm going to talk about pain relief, which is so amazing. Um, hopefully you guys remember my last presentation about pain relief because it's even better this year. It's It's gotten so much better. It's amazing. So let's just start using it. So let's say I have some... Uh, Splitters. Okay, let's say I, I want to make, I just want to have four like even panes in my VI. Let's see if I can do that a little bit more easily with pain relief. It does take a little while to load. Sorry about that. If anyone has any ideas of how to make it faster, please comment on the GitHub repo. I think it's because it has to open the actor framework in a separate application instance. I don't know how to fix it though. Okay, so the first thing you'll notice is if you shift click, you can actually select more than one pane and you can do operations on all of them at once, for example, to set all of them to not have a scroll bar or I can set everything to be blue. You can also just double click on a pane to select all of them. Um, and shift double click on a splitter to select all of those. So you could set everything to be purple or white, whatever. Amazing. Or I could just set the splitters. You know, I don't know. It's a nice color. Um, I could lock all of them at once. And I told you I want these to be even, evenly aligned. So I can just go ahead and align these so that they're even with each other. Amazing. All right. Now here's where it gets really cool. So Let's say I want these splitters to be really small. Here, I'm gonna unlock it for a minute. So I want it to be really small, so I'm gonna try and make it as small as I can. It's two pixels, but let's say that's not small enough for me. I want it to be even smaller. Let's see if we can do one pixel. I have to save it. Uh, 
Oh, there we go. One pixel. Um, can we go smaller? Ah, oh, zero pixels. Beautiful. So I think it's super nice. You can have zero pixel splitter because it, it allows you to um, say you wanted to have a background picture on your application. Um, you can do that because they're, they're size zero, right? Normally, normally if this is a normal size, put my picture here and I can try, I can try to line them up. But, you know, even if I do a really good job of lining them up, there's going to be this, this line in the middle. But if I just set the size to zero, I can get it lined up perfectly and line it up here. So you can have, you can have um, your, you can have whatever background you want and you won't have any splitters if you don't want them. So that's pretty amazing. Um, I totally hacked LabVIEW. Um, actually, it wasn't me. It was this guy on the forums called Florn2007. I don't know who he is. If any of you guys are Florn2007, I'd love to meet you. Um, but it was pretty cool. What you do is um, uh, I guess there's like a, a way that you can get the XML of a VI. So you, you take that XML and then basically I just, par well, you, you parse it and then I just check for like what, what it's saying the bounds are and reset them to be whatever my, my size is supposed to be. And then I put it back into the VI and this is a trick someone else on, on GitHub taught me, which is that you can just revert the VI. So you, you save the new stuff to disk, and then you revert the VI, and it, it takes what's on disk. Um, pretty fun. It is a little bit hacky. And you should be warned that if you do this, you can't actually select your splitters anymore with your mouse. So you'll be forced to use pain relief for everything. Um, but you can just use pain relief. So if you want to change the position, you can do it through pain relief, even though you can't do it with your mouse. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to like everyone who has helped um, on the GitHub repo for pain relief. Um, you know, usually when you have a public repo, I think like other people make bug like make bug reports and then you fix them. But actually with pain relief, it was the opposite. I made a bunch of bug reports on there and like other people fixed them and I just accepted um, their pull requests. So thank you if that was one of you. Um, pain relief is awesome now, you should use it. Any questions? You have one minute and a half, and Andre Bruman is uh, recommending that you check the Karya automatization. I'm sorry, I butchered that, Andre. Dynamic scaling, and he posted the link on the uh, chat. And uh, Stephen says that presentations like this make, uh, oh. make him wish that there was a tip jar at the CLA summit. Epic. Um, I did make a joke. Uh, there is hope in pain relief. Um, uh, um, Danielle is asking, can we make a pain relief extension that functions like Flexbox for CSS or like where we can do essentially media queries and as we resize the window, use the pain relief API to change the layout of the UI element? Um, my, my, my current vision of it right now is just for people to use as they're setting up their re resizable UIs to just, you know, like have the panes set like that. But it, it's a good idea maybe in future. Um, I don't know. I don't I don't have an API for it. Um, I mean, I guess I do like the actors take, take messages, but um, I'm also just call it through the UI. OK, 15 seconds. Why can, can't you select? Because it is zero pixels? Yeah, because it's zero pixels, like you just you literally can't select it because it's zero pixels. So if you make it one pixel, then you can select it. And that's it. It's open source, it's MIT licensed. Okay. And now that's
The last question was by Gregory Jacob, by the way. Thank you, Hope. I'm going to kick you out. Bye. All right. Who's next? Well, next I is Stephen next. Moore. Yes. There you go. So I'm, I'm going to start worried. seven minutes as, you, as soon as you start talking. Uh, right. Go. Wow. Well, see, this is tight. All right. We'll see how we get through. Okay. Well, first off, all right. So I'm going to talk about how you set up a private package repo with GPM. Um, you know, we kind of encourage you to do public uh, sharing of your code, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, and if you're not familiar with GPM, real quickly, it is an open source uh, tool for sharing source code packages. Um, and its big difference is it installs the packages within the project scope, so right alongside the project. It also keeps information about the package uh, dependencies in a JSON file right next to the project file. That allows you to easily restore um, those package files. You don't even have to uh, submit them to your source code control if you don't want to. Um, and it, it was heavily inspired by the Node Package Manager uh, community. So just using what's out there. So in the comparison, you know, NIPM is great for application deployment. In fact, to install GPM, you install it through NIPM. Um, and that's its its wheelhouse. And then GPM is is for source code uh, sharing. Great for reuse libraries. Okay, so real quickly, I am going to show you how to do this. All right. So um, the first thing is you got to set up a folder for your repo. So the caveat here is in in my example, I'm just going to put it in my temp directory. Obviously, that's not where you probably want it. Uh, I think the most common use case, at least that I've used, is putting it on a network share, you know, because companies generally have shares that you can use for that kind of thing. And then uh, you can, you know, share it that way. There are other ways to do that. You can sync folders, local folders with cloud services and other things like that, if you want to go that direction. Um, so, and then to basically tell GPM that uh, you want to use this folder for your local repo, you have to use this GPM config command, which is documented on the, the wiki for the thing. But so you just say GPM config set. And then this is the scope I'm going to use is internal repo. Uh, and then uh, registry. Uh, Okay, so this is all just kind of like syntax. Besides the internal repo section, that's the name of the registry I'm using. And then at this point, if you were doing a share, you would put a couple more slashes, put server in here and share or whatever the location is. But in my case, I'm going to do C colon. And you want to use uh, forward slashes in this. Okay. This command runs real quick. And just so you know, there's a GPM config list command you can do. It will just quickly show you, and you can see their internal repo set up with that path that I that I wanted. Okay, now I'm gonna uh, create a folder for the source code package that I want to to create. Okay, so project, and just for time, I'm just gonna throw some random something in here. And then I'm going to open the GPM browser. So this is how you create a GPM package, or this is how you install GPM packages if you're not familiar with it. Um, so it first thing it wants to do is to have you select the project working directory. So for my case, this is this temp project folder. <clears throat> so um, and then when you create the project name, this is where you put your scope. So I'm going to put an internal repo because I want this to be uh, in my private repo. And I'm going to name it test. Uh, and then I think this, this LabVIEW version actually will populate if you have a project file in the folder, but I don't. And then this private true false thing uh, doesn't apply when you're doing private repos. But I think it's a good idea to set it to private anyways, because then if for some reason you type this wrong and 
uh, accidentally tried to publish it to GPM, this would not publish it. Um, so just something good to do. <clears throat> All right, so that brings up the browser. Uh, this is where you can search for packages, install them. But in my case, I'm just gonna go to this publisher. You can obviously add a bunch of information here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and put publish in here. It says publish complete. So if I go back into my repo, you now see there's an internal at internal repo folder. There's a test folder for that particular package. You also got version information there. And then there's the only file in there. And, and then of course this G package is the JSON file that uh, has all the information in it. So you can, you know, level this up, save it, republish it. You know, you'll quickly see more packages in there. So, and then also um, you can look in the browse here and search for at internal repo. And there's your, there's your test repo on the version that's newest. So there you go. Um, so let me go back to my slides real quick. So all this information is on here. You got to make sure you use forward slashes again. And then also uh, the repo name is case specific. So I got burned by that when I was demoing this. <laughs> so just be aware of that. Um, yeah, any questions? Let's see. All right, well, you know, if anyone has any questions, they want to chat about GPM at all, just let me know. All right, so you have 25 seconds. 25 uh, seconds. I think they're still talking about um, yeah, the I got it. yeah, it's hard to follow Pope, man. She's the best. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so five seconds. You're done? Yeah, there's some, so I'll post this up, but there's some links to the wiki you can look at and just put more packages into GPM. That's what we want. So. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Yep. I'm going to kick you out. Bye. Let's do it. You ready, team? I am. Okay, and then as soon as you finish, I'll let Norm in. People, there, we're going to have time to have Norm in. There you go, team. I'll start the timer as soon as you start talking. Go. All right. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. Hola. Grüßen Sie sich. Namaste. Konnichiwa. Across the entire world, hopefully here. Um, I am talking about sales tips to improve specifications uh, today. And... Uh, I am Tim Nolan from Data Science Automation. Um, this is the same stuff I presented last year, at least as far as my certifications, except I now have my PMP. Um, not that anybody would care. They care more about the fact that I have worked with Ben in the past. And if I've been anointed as Ben's personal CLD, I'm going to ride that for as long as I possibly can. Now, this is a seven by seven presentation. However, I do still want to touch on our giants are female briefly. This is Dr. April Chambers. We marched together in the University of Pittsburgh marching band back in 1999. Uh, she proceeded on to be an honors scholar, uh, an, an, a NIOSH career winner, uh, American Society of Biomechanics honoree, and now she is the doctor and the head of the University of Pittsburgh Human Movement and Balance Laboratory, which is where I did my first LabVIEW project back in 1997. So the circle is now complete, and hopefully she is teaching some people some LabVIEW moving forward. Now, what is this one about? Yes, I am the guy that did a sales presentation last year. However, when I saw on the list of things this year that we're going to be drawing inspiration from outside the LabVIEW community, it came back to some thoughts I'd had, and specifically on something called consilience. Boy, that's a long word. Hey, we're programmers. Why are we talking about long words? But the idea here is that in science and history is the principle that evidence from unrelated sources can converge on a strong conclusion in something else. So what I said is, is there something in sales that can help us out in programming? So really, when you look at sales, it is connecting people who have solutions with people who have needs. 
And as programmers, as developers, as architects, as project managers, that is what we are here to do. Now, sales has the bad rap. You know, it's like, I'm going to give you my business card. and Here's a free pen, buddy. Why don't you talk to me later? That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is understanding what the other person needs from you and what sales techniques you can do to make you a better programmer. Because really, almost everybody at your company is a salesperson. They have a need to convince somebody else. They have a need to uh, get the idea out of somebody else's mind so that they can serve them best moving forward. So we need to talk about what needs do our customers have. Now we can think of our customers and not just because I'm a consultant do I consider customer. When I use the term customer, a customer could be my boss, a customer could be my coworker. I still need to deliver things and figure out things in the same way. Now, what I'm gonna refer to here is the Sandler sales process. Uh, it uses a couple of things. First of all, the challenge model, which is I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions. I'm not gonna come in there thinking that I'm the expert. I want to find out from you what you need from me. And the second part is equal business stature. Now, this is something it brought up in several other uh, management and development things during this presentation, well, not during the, sorry, during this conference, is that you know, quite often it's like, is the customer telling me what to do? Am I telling the customer what to do? Well, either one of those is an imbalance and it, if somebody's not gonna be happy. What we want is to be equal and reach an understanding between each other. So, in Sandler, we have a bunch of these Sandler rules that you can go look up the Sandler sales rules um, out there and there's a bunch of them, but I've condensed a few down here and I wanna kind of look at the things that they represent. Number one, Sandler rule 38. The problem the prospect brings you is not the real problem. <laughs> we were talking about this earlier today. Um, I heard in the uh, expert panel that, you know, this is the issue is that the customer doesn't necessarily know what they want. They might even be asking you for things that don't serve them best. Now, this isn't them being dishonest. Your job is there to help them. Your expertise and your skill at asking the proper questions is what reveals the real issues. I mean, hey, there's whole books on asking questions out there if you want to do it. But let's talk about what we need to look at here. Now, in Sandler, we have something that's called the pain funnel. All right, pain funnel, I know. This sounds like it is a... Um, roller coaster at Ozzy Osbourne's coming soon theme park. But what it really is, is it's trying to narrow things down. You want to find out what the customer's pain is. What is their fear? Because that is what you need to help them with. So as a programmer, likewise, don't just do the first thing they tell you to. Ask for a refinement. So it has a bunch of specific things in it. Can you tell me more about that? Can you be more specific? How long has this been a problem? An example that I often use is a customer asks me for vibration analysis on a machine. So I'll say, well, what are you hoping to see? Well, I wanna see you know, if it's out of thing. Well, what, what goes wrong when it's out of alignment? Well, it breaks down. Oh, okay, well, how long does it break down? Uh, it breaks down for you know every shift once a week. Oh, that seems to be a problem, but that doesn't cost you very much money, does it? Well, yeah, it costs a lot. Okay, so now I have found that it is, I want to avoid the breakdowns of the customer system. So if my product, if my solution that I give them solves what their ultimate pain is, what's their deep down problem, what's their deep down fear, then that's what I'm serving them best. It doesn't matter whether I'm talking about as a salesperson, as a programmer, as a project manager, if that's what I'm serving, that's what I'm helping them out with best. All right, next one. And a lot of people in my last presentation rather liked this one, so I thought I'd go through it in a little more detail. Sandler Rule 23, the best way to get rid of a bomb is to fuse it before it blows up. All right, very dramatic statement for how that works, but what it means is if you know there's going to be a problem or something surprising down the line, don't just wait for it to happen. You know, so say, hey, you know, if I do it this way, I'm going to have to give you a real-time Linux system. Is that a problem? You know, they want to hear it from you and express your expertise early on, such as if we're talking to the IT person or so on. So let them know early on, and then you can guide them through whether that's the way you want to go. This is, again, ties into the risk analysis thing that we're talking to the expert panel earlier. All right. Finally, a decision to not make a decision is a decision. Now, this kind of comes into things like sprints and priorities and so on. A customer will say, hey, I don't know what we want to do for that thing. Now, time is your most precious research on a project. So finding out when a decision can be made is vital. You say, hey, we'll decide that in three weeks. Well, say, great. Happy to talk about it in three weeks. Quick question for you. 
what's going to change between now and three weeks from now? And if they can't tell you, then you say, well, shouldn't we discuss it now? Okay. Now I feel like I'm getting close to my end of my everything here. So I just want to say that if you want to find out more, here are my links, data science automation, my personal blog at nolanscientific.com slash blog. And hey, hit me up on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. And I'm kicking you out. All right. Bye. All right, Norm, you're in. Now, I've heard that you've been drinking um, a little bit during happy hours, so I'm really curious to see how that 7x7 seven seven is going to go. So I just let him in. We'll see. Uh, come on, Norm. There you go. So are you still alive? I am still here, and yes, I have. Um, I, I, I was part of the happy hour celebration. So okay, that, so you're ready to share your screen? You know, I, I will do my best in terms of what I can. If <laughs> can anybody's you share your screen? What's that? Can you share your screen? Oh, can I share my screen? Well, that's a good question. I think I can. Which one am I going to share is always the question. Let's go. <laughs> We're going to share a screen for. I got a plenty. If, let's see. I don't think I need to share my audio. All right, the screen Oh, yeah, is reminder, this is being recorded, um, and I'm going to start the seven minutes as soon as you start talking. Are you ready? Are you ready, Norm? Yes, I'm ready. All right, go. Okay, so we're going to start off, and we're going to talk about black magics of secrets of RF. I'm attempting to take you to share my passion for RF. I was a LabVIEW engineer first and foremost, and that's all I ever did. And then I learned RF and I fell in love with that as well. And I want to take these seven minutes just because somebody said I could and people encouraged me. And we're going to take you from zero to RF in 420 seconds or left. So I am Norm. I work for NI. I'm a chief technical support engineer. I work in the department when you call in and you get help. And this is how I'm about to try to teach you about RF. You will understand RF. You will get to the heart of what RF does along the way. Now, the reality is this is somebody I was first given in the CLA Summit in India, uh, and uh, hence the reason for a very cryptic image behind there for anybody who's not joining us from the subcontinent of India. But in particular, first thing I want to show, and I want to get understanding and appreciation for something that everybody can agree to. Now, it's going to be very challenging since not everybody is in the room, but first and foremost, I want to show you just the very simple construct of making waves. We're gonna go ahead and just make some ripples inside of a pond. We're just gonna go ahead and go right here. I'm gonna go ahead and mute this for myself. This is a guy on YouTube that I like to watch, Veritasium. Now, if you all watch this, now watch what's happening. As, as I let this run, maybe I'll even slow it down a second here. We're gonna go ahead and take this play beat, playback speed. We're gonna put it to a quarter speed here and watch what he does. What is he doing with that little green sphere? Now he's just raising that sphere up and down, but what is happening He's giving some energy to the ball. He's transferring that energy into the water. That energy indeed is going up and down. But what is happening to the perception of that wave front? And man, it's really hard to do this presentation without people around, but I will keep my intensity up for everyone in the room. But indeed that energy, that wave front, indeed you see as propagating away from that core source. And you can even see it. Now he's doing a double slit experimentation for anybody who loves physics and loves about audio and likes to hear about wave cancellation and things like that. This is extremely second nature, but to all of us who are like, wait a minute, what's RF? This is core. This is sacrosanct. This is the base concept that I am causing energy to go up and down, voltage to go up and down, current to flow one direction and another. And that concept causes ripples in the fabric of space and time itself to ripple out into the, to the universe. Think about this one for a second. The United States, NASA, has a, uh, uh, a module outside the scope of the entire uh, solar system in deep space, and we can still communicate to it through these exact same ripples. Now, if you say like, well, Norm, I understand that we can have ripples that are on the surface of a pond, and that all makes good sense to me. Well, wait a minute. How does that work to electricity? Well, for most of us in the room, probably, that there is electricity that is possible. And Fabio will let me know how much time I've got left just to interrupt. Uh, if we can all understand and take advantage of this fact that we know that when we close this circuit, 
there's current that flows and there's an electromagnetic coupling that happens in a circuit that's immediately next to it. That is because there's this invisible force between electrons and the magnetic field. Whether or not you say they're the same or the different, that indeed happens. And now another video to help hopefully drive that point home is an actual, to go ahead and mute this guy here. If you believe this fact, uh oh, I moved too, too far forward. Hold on. Uh oh, oh gosh. Wait, wait, there we go. Hopefully YouTube catches up with me. And this gentleman is indeed showing that we are connecting two different circuits that are separate from each other as you connect and disconnect an individual circuit. And even though you close and you cover this thing with a small piece of cloth, there is still some amount of, of signal that is being transferred from one side indeed to the other. And then we know that indeed this is happening uh, along the way. And so if we can accept this as a truth, as a physical phenomenon that we can leverage, ripples in the pond through this fabric of space and time, space and time itself, why can we not, uh oh, wait, we got Labby here. Why can we not take advantage of that concept where we are stimulating a point source at an individual point? Well, what does that signal now look like at a distance? Now I have this cursor that I'm moving around on this front panel here. Now this front panel in particular is simply showing the amplitude at the crosshairs itself. Now you could take that as if I had an antenna at that individual point. And this fabric of space and time itself is being wiggled and being transferred and being moved across. Now, in particular, you could say that indeed, I would see rising and falling strength of electromagnetic field at that individual point. I'm not caring about what happens in between point A and point B. I don't even care necessarily what happens. All I'm doing is looking at exactly what is at my space time point. In particular, we all know that that signal that we were looking at just a moment ago was indeed a sinusoidal signal. Nothing that crazy, but we're tickling the fabric of space and time itself. And this is amazing if you ask me. Now in particular, we can modify the amplitude, phase, and indeed frequency of that signal overall. It is a sinusoidal signal, we have all the levers. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's change that amplitude versus time. Because really the reality is, I don't care about the fact that there's ripples in the pond. I want to put information, and I'm gonna put my information on the amplitude in particular. Now that amplitude is going to be changing versus time. And let's see what happens when we actually change that amplitude versus time of that overall signal. Now that is not what I'm looking for. Uh oh, uh oh, wait, we got another screen. I got just enough time left. We got a minute, we got a minute, we got barely a minute here. All right, here we go. All right, so now what we've done is we've taken that carrier wave. The carrier wave holds the information. The carrier wave carries the information. And my relevant piece of information here is simply going to ride on that carrier and it's going to modify that amplitude versus time. Now that amplitude versus time, indeed is a very simplistic way of doing it, but don't forget we're engineers. We can move all the levers that we desire to move versus time. All those levers, the amplitude, the phase, the frequency, in any way, shape or form that we so desire. And if you change those things in a very deterministic way, you have the capacity to embed any information on the fabric of space and time itself. And once you've done that, you can get the kittens to view on the internet, through YouTube or any medium of your choice. But that indeed is what we've got. Yola. I think I got me pretty close. Have we lost everyone? Yes, you're done. <laughs> I'm gonna kick you out. Bye. All right. I'm having just way too much fun kicking people out. I shouldn't. Uh, any questions, you can continue the discussion on the breakout rooms. And uh, thank you, everyone. I guess I'm still uh, awake. I'm waiting for uh, Darren, and uh, we're going to start his presentation in about one minute. See you in a little bit.